Do not call this a handle. It's a tote. Okay, I know I'm going to call it a handle many, many times throughout this video, but it's actually a tote. So I was given this transitional plane for Christmas about two years ago. Actually, yeah, it would have been two years ago this Christmas. And I restored most of it, and I got all together, I got it working, but the one problem is it didn't come with a tote. And back then, I quickly carved up this thing just so I could use it, and I was never very happy with it. It was my first attempt at carving a tote, and I kind of made it to fit my hand, but I didn't have any template to go off, and I really had no idea what I was doing. So I want to make a new one for this. I want to make a tote that, number one, feels good, and number two, looks right as opposed to this clunky thing. Now, the more you use them, the more you realize something with totes is that a very comfortable tote really makes the plane. If this tote is really comfortable and feels good in the hand, it's going to be a nice plane to use. Another thing you're going to notice with the totes and with, with saw handles is that uh, you get to see the difference between a handmade tote and one that came off of a router. And the router has this really nice crisp round edge all the way around, but it comes to this perfectly flat on the side. Whereas a handmade one really doesn't have any flat spot. It rounds off into infinity. It may have been initially carved with a router, but then it will be shaped further so that you have a really nice grip coming all the way around. So it's basically a big oval as opposed to having a flat spot on both sides. And that really makes a big difference in the difference between a cheap tote and one that you're going to love to use for a long time into the future. So when it actually comes time to create the tote, most of the time you're going to have the old tote. It may be broken, uh, but you can then use that as the pattern. Lay it out on a piece of paper and trace it out, and use that as the pattern you want to use. Um, if you don't have the tote, then you might want to grab one off another plane and use it as the pattern. Also, Lee Valley has a couple sets of these patterns. I'll leave a link to them down below where you can get them for the three or four or for the five. Um, and this is a this is a general shape. There are a lot of other things that were different in different types of Stanleys and Starrets and others along the way. So you might want to get a little bit more specific, but generally one of these two handles will work perfectly for most planes. So for this build, I'm going to be using this plan. It's a fairly simple, straightforward design, and you can print it out. And it has the graduation here on the side, so you can set a ruler up against it and make sure that it is to scale. The other thing you want to do is figure out how you want the grain to go. There are some odd people out there who like the grain to run vertically along the handle. The intention is as you're pushing on it, it's going to add more strength. The problem is it's going to end up breaking right here or right here very, very easily. The traditional method is actually to have the grain running parallel with the bottom, parallel all the way across. And this gives you a fairly strong strength because the bolt is holding everything together. And that's why a lot of times you're going to notice that the break is actually like right across here here um, in parallel with the bottom. A lot of modern makers actually like to skew it about 20 degrees and have the grain going at a slight angle through it. Um, I like to keep it fairly simple. I like to keep it traditional and keep the grain parallel with the bottom. So what I did is I have this piece of white oak and I found a piece that will fit uh, and I'll keep one good side that is jointed flat to the bottom and that bottom will then become the reference surface for everything. Now if I really wanted to I would find a piece of rosewood to carve this out of or something that is um, something that is diffuse porous. Um, oak is ring porous and snaps fairly easily, so usually this isn't the best choice for making a, a, a tote, but I like white oak. I love the way it looks. I like the way it feels. I like seeing the diffuse porous and the finish, so I'm going to be using this piece of oak to make my tote. Use whatever you want on your own. The very first thing I want to do is actually joint it, and I want to have a good flat surface that I can um, take everything off of. This will become my reference surface for the whole project. So I don't need much of this. I just need a space, you know, about four or five inches long that I can then work off of. Next thing I want to do is cut this to length. Now, basically, I have this jointed, so I have this top surface or the bottom surface of the tote, and I want to cut a distance from here to here. Now, if I was being very, very careful about how much wood I was using, um, then I would measure out a specific distance and cut it, or I might even nest the totes together so that I can get multiple pieces out. I really don't care about that as much. I have a ton of white oak around, and so I'm just going to cut it somewhere about here, probably about five inches in. So I'm not even caring about being square. Just going to start it and cut. Next thing, because this is rough sawn, I want to have a nice smooth surface I can glue the pattern to. 
So I could come in with a scrub plane and take off a good chunk of material and then come back in and finish up with the plane. But I don't need that much and I don't want to take off too much material. So I'm just going to cut down through the junk and get down to a nice smooth surface that I can apply my pattern to. For gluing down the pattern, everyone out there has their own method or the glue they want to use or tape they want to use. And I don't know why, but I get a lot of people that really don't like me using the glue stick. But oh well, I like using these glue sticks. They come up easily, they work well, uh, and they apply nicely, good strength, they hold through the whole thing. So I use glue sticks. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but this is my show, so I'm going to make it what I want to make it. So I'll let that sit for a couple minutes, and then we'll come back and start working on it. Now, the next thing I want to do is actually clamp it up in the vise. Because all the grain is running across it this way, if I try to drill out one of these larger holes, this lead bit, uh, lead screw in the front is basically like a large wedge. If this is open out here, there's a chance that that screw might actually split the wood out. So clamping it up in this stops that from splitting out. So on these two, there's two holes here, and the uh, pattern already lays out exactly where the center is. So I can just set that in there, and I can drill out a three-quarter inch hole, and then an inch and a quarter hole. So let's dive in. And I just want to go until I have the lead screw sticking out the other side, and then I'll flip it over and drill out the other side. That way I don't end up splitting out that side and causing issue. So with that, I can finish out the hole on this side. Now for this one, I don't have an inch and a quarter bit, but I do have a one inch bit, so rather than putting it right in the middle and leaving it a little ways away, what I want to do is move it over a little closer to the edge so that I'm basically covering, cutting out that same area. I'm just going to have to remove a little bit more with a file, but that's perfectly fine. I, have, I mean, I have an inch and a quarter bit, but it's not a very good one, and it causes more issues than it's worth, so let's just use this. So now that I have these two drilled out, basically I just need to cut along that line. But before I want to cut that, I actually want to drill this out. Now, for some reason, I decided to drill these before drilling that. It really doesn't matter um, as long as you drill out your center hole before cutting, before cutting out the whole jig. Because it becomes a lot harder to drill that afterwards. So, let's uh, cut that out. Now the first hole to drill is a recess. It's actually a larger hogged out hole in the bottom to fit this, well, where the threading of this goes into. So I got a 9 16 inch bit and I've transferred across the line on the pattern and so I'm going to pick out a spot right in the middle. Eyeball it to center. Yeah, it looks about good. Then I put a flag on the bit at my stopping point. So I'm going to start it out and then I'm just going to eyeball to make sure I'm going down straight. This one doesn't have to be terribly straight, but Straight is preferable to not straight. So we're just going to bore it down a little ways until the flag touches. About there. There's that hole. Now the next hole I need to drill is the long shaft running down the middle. That is a 9 16 inch bit, so I have that in there. Rather than chalking up like this and trying to drill at an angle, what I actually want to do is put that line straight up and down. So I'm going to get a square out here and know that my line is square. And that makes it a lot easier to eyeball that you're running straight down the hole. So I'm going to lock that in place. And I'm going to get my bit and set it on that line that I made. Center it up. And I'm going to step back here because it's very important that I'm in line this way as well as this way. So I'm going to check here. I'm going to go down a little ways. I'm going to move over here. I'm going to stay on that line and just eyeball it. Move back over here. I'm just going to keep going until I get all the way down. And so by this point, I'm basically locked on whatever trajectory I'm going on because the bit's just going to go. I'm just waiting until I pop out the other side. There it goes. Now we get to see just how accurate I am. And then you can see how the hole came out right in the center. Very, very pleased with how that came out. Sometimes you're off by a sixteenth or so. That's why you're drilling a five sixteenths hole as opposed to a quarter inch hole. So now we have our main hole running all the way through. We need to drill out this little tap piece. 
Now for the top portion of this, I actually need to drill a hole that is 7 16 and if I were just going to be using the, uh, the normal auger bits, then I would have drilled the large hole first and then drilled the long straight hole second. Um, but my 7 16 auger bit is a poor one, I need to get a better one. Uh, so I have the 7 16 spiral bit and I find it easier to drill the main hole first and then this can then rest in that hole and, and uh, kind of flatten out. So now I need to drill down all the way down to this depth. So I'm going to put this mark here and put a piece of tape on there so that I know I can stop at that depth. And just like that, we're ready to start shaping this. Now I could come at this with a scroll saw or with the uh, coping saw, and I could cut this all out. But if you look at it, most of these lines are fairly straight. And so what I prefer to do is actually just come at it with a small crosscut saw and make most of my cuts with that, and then come back and refine it with a rasp in a little bit. So let's start working on that. So basically I'm just coming in and I'm making cuts occasionally until I get close to the line like that. And I'll come in with this one and cut out here. Now this is a crosscut saw and right now I'm cutting in a rip format. Oh well, it might wander a little bit, but back here, wandering is not a problem. I'm just going to kind of break out these pieces. And I'll be left with these little jagged things here, but those clean up really fast with a rasp. So I'm just going to keep working my way around it and uh, cut out everything I need. And there you have it, a fairly roughed out cut, and we can come to smooth this out. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a rasp, and I'm going to get rid of all these saw marks, and just kind of smooth it out and give it a nice rounded feel to the handle. Now a rasp is indeed a two-handed tool. And here you can see I'm blowing out on this side. I'm not too worried about that, because in a little while I'm going to be coming back through and rounding this over. But I don't want to make it massive, so I'm kind of leaning back a little ways on myself. And I just kind of want to flatten things out and get rid of the saw marks. I want to have new rasp marks on there, all the way around. And with this fast of a rasp, it doesn't take very long at all to get just down to the scratches of the rasp. And on these inside curves, where I'm just not going to be able to get into this very well without causing more damage, I do have a very large rat tail that I use. I just have to be careful not to let this sit in any one time, so I'm constantly moving it in that arch so that I'm not burning out any one spot. So now that I've basically gotten rid of everything that I need to get rid of with this massive heavy rasp, I'm going to come back through with this combo. And this, I like this one, it just allows me to get in a little bit easier. And with this one, this is what I'm going to usually transfer from rasp work into file work. This file will leave a much smoother texture. So I'm just going to slowly work through this. Just like I did with the rasp, only takes a few minutes. I'm just going to clean up. Now I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'm going to be removing all these in a moment. I just want to get a nice rounded surface that I'm okay with. Something that I, I don't feel bad with right now. So now it is shaped and smoothed out. And now I need to go through carving this and actually wrapping it all around and making it feel good in the hand. And at this point, what I'm going to be doing is basically slowly working everything down with. I'm going to be starting with a very, very heavy rasp. I want to take off a lot of material and I'm going to keep feeling it and seeing, you know, does this feel good? Do I need to do some more work here? So to kind of get an eyeball on how much I'm taking off around, I'm going to use a pencil here. And I'm just going to come around and put a mark in a little ways. That's basically what I'm going to be wanting to get rid of on most of this. I'll have that taper out there. So I can do the same thing on this side. And I'm going to come out with the rasp. Now I always want to work, all the grain is running up like this. I want to work with the grain. In other words, if I come down like this side, all those grains are going to be wanting to pop out and break out. So I want to actually be coming uphill with it here. So I'm just going to slowly work at it. Lift weight off of it. I want the weight to all be 
on my hand, not on the rasp itself. And so I'm gonna start down here low, slowly bring it up and around. Until I get that nice profile that reaches halfway. The other thing I forgot to put on there is a halfway mark. With this halfway mark, that is where I want to round to on either side. So I want it as it rounds up and over, that it's just nicking that as it comes flat. And then we can keep on going. Little bit by little bit, we're gonna be rounding it generally to that shape. Starting down low, bringing it out. Then this inside curve, I'm gonna use this rat tail. It goes a little bit slower because it's a file structure but it'll give me a little cleaner cut to begin with. I like to start back here and go until I touch that line and then slowly wrap it around. And keep going around until I touch that midway line. Just constantly smoothing it out like that. And then I wanna be careful as I get up here near the horn because there's a chance if I push too hard or I bounce on it, I might break it. And then all that work goes down the drain. Now I can go back to this. This just takes off more material faster, making it a little bit easier. You can see how I'll switch back and forth between tools until I get what I'm looking for. And at this point, I'm gonna be starting to feel it and think, you know, is there any point that is causing me issue? Is there anything I wanna work on? And then move on to the other side. Second verse, same as the first. Just keep going. Then one thing I'll occasionally do is I'll grab another handle and I'll hold them both and I'll feel how they feel and I'll see what I like, what I don't like. Now one thing about the original handles, they tend to be a little bit thinner than I want. Um, I end up usually making mine about a sixteenth of an inch thicker. Just gives them a little bit more body to hold on to. You also notice that I'm leaving this rough out here. That's fine because once I come to this side, I'm going to be rounding all the way over and that rough will disappear once I do this ridge. So I've got this basically roughed out. You can see there's a lot of dips and bumps and other things that I'm probably going to clean up just a little bit like this one right here. Um, but I'm going to do basically the exact same thing to this side here. I'm going to leave the top alone because I like to leave this nice and flat, just like the originals. And uh, then once I get this all roughed out, we're going to come back and look at how to smooth that out and make it feel beautiful. So now I've gone all the way around the body with a rough rasp and a medium rasp, and I've kind of gotten most of it shaped out. It feels relatively good in the hand. Um, it's the way I like it. It's slightly thicker than the... Uh, than the traditional Stanley, it's just about right. And I'm really liking it. You see how this is, I'm getting rid of most of the, uh, um, the rough sawn wood as I come across. And so what I'm gonna be doing now is I'm basically just gonna be keeping going over it with a thinner and thinner file. So now I've done this medium rasp, I'm gonna come at it with a fairly coarse file, and I'm gonna go into it with a file, and then I'm gonna go into it with a medium file, and then fi finally I'm gonna smooth it all out with this fine file. And then I'm gonna come at it with some sandpaper and a bow sander and really clean it out. And one of the things is on these inside curves, people tend to go right across the curve and that makes a gully right there. What you actually wanna do is, rather than just moving across it, you wanna move down as well. So as you come across, you're pushing down and out. And that stops you from doing any particular curve. And then you're constantly changing your angle until you get a really nice, clean, smooth surface all the way across. So I'm going to slowly work through this file by file and kind of give you an idea of that. And then I'll show you what I do for sanding and finishing. The one thing you may notice, I'm not doing these corners yet. Um, I like to wait on these two corners until it's all done. Once everything is smooth, it's feeling good, everything is the way I want it, then I'll round these out and those will be the very last finishing touches on this beast. So let's keep at it. One of the goals of each grit is to get rid of the marks left by the last grit. And so you're kind of getting an idea of that. Occasionally I'll wet it down and that lets me see those a little bit better. I'm just going to be slowly working at it. This whole process is probably going to take about two hours or so to get close to it. I'll be switching between several files, finding the ones that work well, not putting too much pressure in it, taking my time, being patient. Patience is a key.
Occasionally your files fill up and they stop cutting as much. You can just hit them with a card file. It's basically just a wire brush, but very stiff, flat wires. Those clean it out and suddenly it'll be cutting as good as new all of a sudden. Especially when filling it up with this paper. Then for the last pass of the file, I actually want to come in and just make single stroke, full strokes all the way across. Use the flat side of the file whenever possible. And try to be careful on the bottom parts where I'm curving. And then on this top horn, I'm going to do the same thing over again. I want this whole top horn to be really nice and smooth. It's vibrating a bit too much, so I'm going to put a little lower in the vise. See if that fixes it. There we go. I'm going to come at that with one file after another until I get down to a really nice, smooth, flat top. Files will keep it nice and flat across the top, whereas sandpaper will kind of round it out. So after working it with a file for a while, I've gotten it fairly smooth, but I'm going to spend a good bit of time with the bow sander. And I really like this. It's a very simple tool. I have a whole video on making it. It's just a, a bow with these knobs on either end, and you can cut off pieces of a belt sander belt, put them in there, and it allows you to put a solid amount of pressure, and it holds to the curves. So you can even get into these tight curves like this, and just work around it. Really, really useful tool for these compound curves, getting into things like this. For these handles, it's, it's really invaluable. It's like a file on steroids. But I'll just do most of the smoothing to finish up on that. So I'm just going to go all the way around this. I'm probably going to spend about 20, 30 minutes, maybe a little longer on this. Take a good bit of time making it smooth and making it right. So once I've gotten it to where I want with the bow sander, I have these corners I need to round out. And these, there's two on the top and two on the bottom. So I'm going to be basically doing the exact same thing. I wait on those until I've gotten most of the rest of the work done. And I'm going to use a, a rasp to take away most of the material. And I want to kind of make it like an octagon right here on the end. There, I've gotten basically these two angles that are very, very similar. And I'm going to start back here flat with the surface, kind of round this corner, round this corner until I'm flat with the nose. Then I'm going to start back here, round this corner, round that corner until I'm flat with the nose. Then I'm going to come in with my fine file. I'm going to skip straight from the rasp to the fine file. And then this gives you that really nice profile as long as you work it around. Always be moving it, don't let it grind in any one spot, otherwise you'll end up with a flat spot. And now I've got this really nice sharp edge from what I sanded down here to that corner there, and that's what I'm really looking forward to, looking for on there. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the back end of the horn here. And this way the file will give you that really nice crisp edge that sandpaper just can't give you. Really kind of nice edge there, I like that. So after doing all the sanding, I'm going to be feeling it. I want to make sure that everything feels good in my hand. I want to make sure that everything is just the way I want it. And this one really feels like it. I kind of like the, I like it. It's a little more beefy than your normal plane. It fits nicely in the hand. It's a really nice tight grip in there. The one last thing I have to do is this particular one has ridges right here. In the normal Stanley planes, there aren't these ridges on either side. It just sits flat on the surface. But I need to make sure that it's going to sit in between those. So that just means I have to file off a little bit on each of these corners to make it fit down into those. So just a little bit of work like that. And this one will fit down in. So the last thing I want to do before finish is do a full test fit. So I put the threading rod in there, bolted the whole thing down, and checked it out. And unfortunately, I realized I'm running into the lateral lever here. Uh, the handle is a little taller. And uh, oops, um, so it's not perfect. So I have a couple options. Number one, I can go back to the old one, which on the old one you can see it's a little lower there. Or number two, I can modify this handle and make it work. So I'm just going to take this back to the drawing board and modify the handle just a little bit. I just have to take about an eighth inch off the top corner here and it should work out fine. So after a bit of a fiddling I 
but basically just rough ground it back with the rasp. I've got a good bit more work to do on it, but I've gotten to the shape where I know that it's going to pass over here. So now that I see that, I'm going to put a pencil mark in here at the top side of the back of that, and I need to take it down to that mark. So I'm now going to rasp off everything from here back to here. As you see, I left a little bit more head back here because I wasn't quite sure. So now we're gonna flatten all this out, make this a little bit thinner, and it should be ready to go. Now as I'm grinding this, I'll start back here, and by the end of the stroke, I've lifted my handle and I'm trying to wrap up all the way around. So I'm not staying flat. I'm not putting a lot of pressure. I'm not pushing down on it. I'm just letting the rasp do the cutting. Oops, that was a little heavy there. And I'm just keeping on. And I'm keeping an eye on that line that I made. I want to see until I get close to that. I still have a ways to go though. I'm right about at that line, and so now I'm going to go back to the other files and smooth this out. There, we got a nice fine, fine finish. I'm going to go test it one more time. If I'm happy with where it's at, we're going to go on to the finishing of it. Now, for a finish on the handle, um, this is where things kind of get picky. Everyone has their own preferred method. Um, a varnish is a very common old method. Um, a shellac is a very common method. Uh, they both build up a really nice finish on the edge, um, especially with shellac, you can get this really nice cleaned buffed edge on it. But for my money, boiled linseed oil. I just, I don't know why, I love boiled linseed oil and paste wax, especially on anything you hold in your hand, it just feels so much better. So I'm just gonna literally dump this in here, and I'll dump the other side in there. Really quick and simple application. Just gonna let it sit out here for a moment to dry. And then in like 10 to 15 minutes, most of this will be soaked up. I'm gonna go and dump it again. I'll let it set out to dry. I'm gonna do that three or four times until it completely stops soaking it up. Then I'm gonna wipe it off and put on some paste wax. And I'll come back for the paste wax here. Okay, now that I've come back, I'm gonna wipe off all the excess, wipe it down into the bench, adds another layer of finish on here. Oh, I love the feel of it with it. When it's still slightly wet on the outside. That's what I, that's what I love. Then I'm gonna come in and apply the paste wax. And I'm just going to rub it in and work it in. Let it sit. And rub it into all the pores, the nooks, the crannies, everything in there. I'm probably gonna do this two or three times. So I'm just gonna let that sit and wait until that paste wax basically dries. Come and wipe it off. It should be about another hour or so and we'll be ready to reassemble. So the last thing before installing it is buffing it out and making it shiny. I just like to use a simple rag, rub it down. And I'm not sure why, and I really don't know why, but I really like the look of the, the stained wood on the outside left over from the rough sawn material. If I could have, I, I mean, if originally I could have planed that off and made it smooth, made it disappear, but I really like how that came out. And once you buff off that wax and it dries up, oh, it just feels so good. I mean, that's just a, you can feel the grain, you can feel the ridges, and with the white oak, you can see all the flaring from that. Just a very beautiful piece of work. So now we can put the whole thing back together. So let's slide that down in. And voila, we have a perfectly functioning plane. And I really love the look of that white oak on there. That's just, that's happiness. Feels fantastic in the hand. Oh yeah, just so much better than I got a shellac finish that just builds up on there, you can't feel the wood. And I'm in love with that. Put a little bit of paste wax on it once a year or so and it'll last you for the rest of your life. Just really, really happy with how they came out. So there you have it. A tote really is not that difficult of a thing to make. It's actually fairly simple once you break it down. And a hand-carved, hand-wrapped handle, uh, that, that grip is just something that is going to feel fantastic. And it automatically stands out as a high-quality job as opposed to something that was done with a router. You can automatically see the difference just from the finish and how the router leaves it and how they shaped out. So I'm really, really happy with how this came out. I'm looking forward to using the plane and uh, using it for many years to come. I do wanna say thank you to the patrons on Patreon. I don't do any sponsored videos, so you guys really are the reason why I can keep putting out videos like this. If you'd like to find out more about that or uh, help out, 
Patreon's right down here. Also, if you'd like to subscribe and see some more behind-the-scenes footage, you can do that as well. That's about it for today. Until next time, have a wonderful day.